pain, misery, sadness, any synonym of the word awful or just insanely awful you can come up with. That is what pathetic. we just experienced. Pathetic. I, would, I watched a pathetic football game from the Giants. That's how I feel. All off season, all they've done, and I, I can barely speak right now. I'm, I'm so mad. I got to take up boxing or something. I'm going to punch a hole in my wall. All off season, we heard from the coaching staff. We heard from the players saying, we're going to be better. We're going to do more. We're investing money into our offense. We're investing into our team and our coaching staff. And we just watched one of the most embarrassing offensive performances I've seen in years. And we're talking about a team that just spent 80 plus million dollars on adding Kenny Galladay, who barely even played in the first half or barely got any targets in the first half. He had more targets in garbage time than he did in actual meaningful football quarters this in this game, right? How does that make sense? Kadarius Tony, he had one end around that he was done for the whole game. Didn't see him again. Maybe another screen. He had one screen. W- what was Jason Garrett's plan here? What did they, what were they expecting from this New York Giants team with what we just saw on the field? It was pathetic. It was embarrassing. Anthony, you you say something. I can't. Yeah, I think this was embarrassing. I think Jason Garrett came in with no game plan, and whatever game plan he had was just awful. I mean, the failure to utilize the talent on the roster is the most glaring issue within Jason Garrett's game plan today, the failure to utilize Kadarius Tony in a way that maximizes his value, um, the failure to get Kenny Galladay even remotely involved in the offense in the first half. He really only showed up during garbage time, which was ridiculous, which was just inexcusable. Kenny Galladay looked like a superstar. He looked like the guy that we paid $18 million a year for. He looked phenomenal in the fourth quarter during garbage time when the game was pretty much already out of reach. So where was that in the first half? Why wasn't that utilized in the first half? We had an opportunity in the red zone in the first half that we squandered. We could have maybe utilized Kenny Galladay in that part of the game. He really was only used in the, in, at the end of the game when it didn't matter. And you know what? A lot of this game felt like what what matters here? Like, I don't know, man. I, I'm just as frustrated as you, Alex. I'm confused. I'm disappointed. I'm embarrassed. I think the Giants played an embarrassing, pathetic football game. I thought the offense was embarrassing. I, I thought the defense wasn't that much better. The secondary looked horrible. We've talked a lot about how good the secondary is, about how much talent there is in this loaded secondary. It really didn't feel that way. It felt like every fourth down, there was somebody just running wide open in a busted coverage, or there was a man getting beat in man-to-man coverage, or you know, they're tight on coverage, but they're still allowing eight yards gained with you know. Third and 10, so fourth and two, easy conversion. The inability to get off the field from the Giants defense was just ridiculous. Every third down, every fourth down, Denver was just finding the open man. They were converting. And then, of course, Melvin Gordon ripping off a 70 yard touchdown run to just, you know, ice the cake. The whole game was just a disaster, start to finish. I felt a little bit of momentum in the first quarter, but those Broncos offensive drives were just going on for 10 minutes at a time. Like The Giants defense just could not get off the field. They forced one turnover. They almost had another, got called back. Daniel Jones had a turnover. We're going to talk about that, I'm sure, Alex. It's just this was kind of a demoralizing start to the season. I know that it's a short week. We get back to it on Thursday, so we'll see how that goes, but this is just painful. This is one of the worst losses I've ever seen to open a year from this Giants team, and we've seen a lot of them. We haven't won a first game since 2016. There were two plays in this game that crushed my spirits. Two plays. The first one was Daniel Jones' fumble. That was the first play that crushed my spirits. They're on a beautifully productive drive. It was efficient. They were throwing the ball well, getting receivers open. And Daniel Jones, who 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 actually uses both hands to clutch the football, still fumbles it. He still fumbles it, even though he's holding it with two hands. His weak little children arms, hands for feet, Daniel Jones, cannot hold the ball with two hands, and he fumbles it anyway. And then, just to just to go on a little bit further, he doesn't even slide. Like, slide, bro. The, the, they design, to, the NFL is designed to protect quarterbacks. They want to give you the advantage any chance you get. If you slide and someone even touches you, there's a flag 90% of the time, okay? It happened to Teddy Bridgewater twice today. Slide, bro. Just slide and, and, and don't risk fumbling because your arms are made of glass. You know, you have twigs for arms. I don't understand. 
Yeah, and, and the thing is, this has been a problem for Daniel Jones. It doesn't go away. In his rookie season, his second season, now in his third season, still not sliding, still not protecting the football properly. Yes, he held it high and tight. His form was proper. He was holding the football properly. He had two hands on the ball. It looked like he wouldn't fumble that. But still, why are you even compromising your body in that situation? Just slide and live to see another down. Instead, he just tries to run through contact like he's a running back, like he's Devontae Booker going up the middle. Like, what are you doing, Daniel Jones? Just take the yardage that you already gained, slide, and live to see another down. That stuff just confuses me. I know he slid later on in the game after he had already made the fumble, but it's like the damage is already done. You can learn from it later on in the game, but like you've already cost your team big time by refusing to slide and trying to play a little bit of hero ball, which has been a criticism that I've had of Daniel Jones for quite some time now. I, I think that in certain situations and games, he really likes to play hero ball and it, it never really seems to work out in his favor. So this is just another opportunity missed and just another situation where Daniel Jones, once again, shoots himself and shoots the team in the foot for a simple mistake that should have been corrected two years ago. And, you know, I'm one of the most optimistic people out there. I try my best to remain positive, talk about the good portions of this team. I've had it with Daniel Jones. I've, I've, I've reached my breaking point. And a lot of people have reached their breaking point a long time ago. And kudos to you, you know, for, for figuring it out early. I tried to stay positive. I've reached it. You know, there was a couple of plays that really stood out to me. One, the fumble, of course. The second one, it's fourth and 16 in the end zone. You have Kenny Galladay and man coverage against Ronald Darby, and you throw it too far in the end zone that actually goes out of the end zone into the into the back. You know what I mean? It's fourth and 16. Throw it to the pylon where your guy is standing and let him try to make a play. Why do you have to throw it all the way to the back corner of the end zone and risk throwing it out of bounds, which is exactly what happened on fourth and 16? You know, it's just basic stuff. It's basic stuff to give your receiver an opportunity, give your team an opportunity to get some momentum to, to maybe win in the future. And Daniel Jones does everything to hurt himself, right? Everything he does. And he's had some good throws. He had some great, you know, pocket awareness at times. But you cannot continue to turn the ball over. He was bailed out of an interception because Kenny Galladay looked like an absolute animal. He looked phenomenal, Kenny Galladay. He looked like a wide receiver one. And the Giants didn't use him until the fourth quarter when they already lost. The game was over already. And they waited too long. You know what I mean? They should have been targeting him heavily the entire first half. They cannot wait until the second half of games to get points on the board anymore. It's always the same thing every single year. It feels like they're using regular season games to test and try different things on offense when these things should already be ironed out going into the season. You had a full preseason. You had a full training camp. And you still look like you're testing things out. Like you don't have it figured out yet. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? You're preaching. No, you're completely preaching right there. And I want to jump in right away and say, I felt concern. I didn't make a big deal out of it on the podcast or on this channel or anything. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't want to freak people out. But when Joe Judge, and you guys know, I'm the leader of the Joe Judge fan club. I love that guy who I have to criticize pretty heavily today. And I'm not happy to do it, but he coached a horrible game and he really cost the team big time with that stupid challenge stupid that he tried to throw shit. on a touchdown. That stupid was stupid. Shit, he talks about being mentally disciplined and then he does stupid that. Shit. That's you hypocritical. That shit. That's stupid. And that does irk me completely because I go to bat for this guy every single day, but just the inability to execute on these plays. And, you know, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm almost at a loss of words here, but Joe Judge really kind of disappointed me today. I got off on that tangent about Judge and then lost my train of thought. And I, I just like, you know, when you're when you're throwing challenge flags on touchdowns and you're the head coach of a team, you deserve all the criticism in the world. And again, it pains me to criticize him for that, but I have to. Look, this team, the, there's a couple of things that Joe Judge preaches, right? One of them is discipline. This team showed none of it today. They showed no discipline on defense. They missed tackles. The other the other play that stood out to me was when Teddy Bridgewater's literally being backed up. Xavier McKinney is in his face. He's being backed up. He's running backwards, and he throws a pass to his tight end. And Blake Martinez misses the tackle, which would have been a fourth down. They would have had the momentum back. You know, it would have been a field goal. They would have been totally fine. Instead, he throws it to the tight end. Blake Martinez completely whiffs on a tackle, and he dives for a touchdown. That was the second play that really sent me over the edge and said that this team is just – they you cannot do that. You know what I mean? You have a guy in, in Teddy Bridgewater's face who's he's not a great quarterback. We made him look like Joe Montana today. You know, there's a reason Teddy Bridgewater has been a journeyman quarterback his entire career. He is not what he's not the type of quarterback that does what he just did to this Giants defense today. And and it obvious it's obvious based on the fact that 
no team has ever stuck with him. You know what I mean? He looked great today. And it's it's mainly because the Giants secondary was completely out of form. They were leaving receivers wide open. Like, when I tell you wide open, there was – I remember KJ Hamler, the broken coverage where you dropped that pass. The Giants got bailed out by that. You know what I mean? That was a broken coverage. You cannot do that with a secondary that already has a year of experience under their belt and has Logan Ryan, uh, Jabril Peppers, and Xavier McKinney back there. It's unacceptable. You know what I mean? There were very few players that looked good in this game. Logan Ryan looked good. He was the only defender that really stood out to me. Um, Blake Martinez rush, looked good minus like a couple missed tackles. Like he had tackle, one costly though, missed though. tackle. Yeah, it led yeah. to a touchdown, but he did have a couple good plays. A couple. <laughs> Aziz Ojolari had the sack. He had a rough in the passer as well, though, so it just kind of canceled out. It's like it felt like players were taking one step forward and then two steps back. That's how I felt. Lorenzo Carter disappointed me. Dexter Lawrence disappointed me. Leonard Williams had a couple of pressures. But overall, the entire pass rush was quiet. Like Denver's offensive line is not that good. They're good, not great. Our defensive line is supposed to be one of the best in the league. And we saw them do nothing. One player that I'll praise was Darnay Holmes. I thought he had a pretty good game. He did have that roughing penalty, you know, that unnecessary roughness. That was Mm -hmm. stupid. But he did play pretty well. He had a couple pass breakups, and he was in pretty tight coverage. So I'm I'm a little bit encouraged by that, you know, looking at the long-term sake of this defense. Pretty encouraged Mm -hmm. by Darnay. I also thought Jabril Peppers looked up. He was flying around the field. He made some nice plays. Tay Crowder had a couple of nice plays, but he also did not look good in coverage either. There was an individual thing, plays that looked okay, and then others, it was just not, it was just inconsistent across the board. A lot of inconsistency, but my thing with Peppers is like, yeah, I think that he played pretty well. His coverage was always tight, you know, and so there was a lot of plays where the tight end would catch the ball and then instantly Jabril Peppers would tackle him. So there's no yards after catch. There's like zero yards after catch when Jabril Peppers is in coverage. So he's playing good coverage, but it's still not tight enough to break up any passes. Like these guys are still catching the ball and gaining eight yards a pop, and then you have a third and two. And then they convert. So it's like almost at the same time. It's just, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, just there's so many things that this team can improve on and individual players can improve on. And I don't know. And I'll also say this one thing, you know, we were all kind of like, ah, oh, Evan Engram's out, whatever. I honestly we felt him. like we, 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 we missed, missed him. him pretty badly. Mm-hmm. His presence, his absence was really felt, especially on that play down near the uh, goal line. Daniel Jones tried to throw a timing route to Kyle Rudolph. Kyle Rudolph had it completely mistimed and never looked for the ball, and it almost became an interception. That one really, in my eyes, wasn't on Daniel Jones. I just think that is a pay- that is a play where him and Evan Engram might be on the same page because they know how they like to run and throw that route. Kyle Rudolph maybe just didn't have that, and he just never looked for it. It was it was terrible. It, the chemistry was really right. not there between those two. Yep. And I will say this though, I'm going to try my best to put two positives out there. Okay. Two positives. One of them, Sterling Shepard. He looked freaking awesome today. Sterling Shepard looked awesome. He had 113 yards and a touchdown. That first touchdown was sick. His yards after the catch was great. He, he was all over the field. He was getting open. He was making catches. I thought he was phenomenal. I think he's going to have a fantastic year no matter how this Giants team looks. He's going to be one of those guys that I stashed on my bench um, in, in fantasy that I think is going to end up being a great player, and I'm probably going to start him next week. Um, <laughs> but I will say this. The other the other portion of the game that did actually not look terrible was the offensive line and pass protection. Daniel Jones had time in the pocket. You know what I mean? There were a couple of individual plays that Solder got beat. Um, but for the most part, Andrew Thomas looked good. You know, Ben Bredesen looked good. Nick Gates looked good. Will Hernandez looked good. Nate Solder was the only one that I really noticed was not playing well at times. Overall, the pass protection was solid. Daniel Jones had enough time to make the throws. You know, they just didn't, you know, or, or he tried to run or he, or he threw a bad pass, you know, overall, or, or really the reality of it is the Giants offense just wasn't on the field that much. You know what I mean? Denver had two drives that were 10 plus minutes. That's almost, that's a quarter and a half. You know, out of two drives, okay, two drives. They, they had two drives that were ten plus minutes. The Giants had the ball for twenty four minutes, so they basically had it for two Denver Broncos minutes. drives. Thirty five minutes. They had. Yeah, they, they held 10 the ball for a long more, time. Ten minutes more than the Giants had, um, including five more first downs. Right, they both had one turnover. Look, this is okay. Overall, Anthony, we'll do an offensive and a defense section. Let's start with the offense. What did we learn today? I learned a couple things. One, Daniel Jones's turnover problems are not going away. 
This is something that we're just going to have to oh, live with. And that's one I, I got to jump in right away. The, the turnover problems, I understand he only turned the ball over that one time with the fumble. He but threw probably bad. four passes that should have been intercepted. He kept throwing it like right to defenders. He was misreading coverages. He was staring down the first read for like five seconds before finally throwing the ball into coverage. There's a lot that you do pre-snap and post-snap that really uh, separate you from being a backup and a starting level quarterback. And what we saw from him was very much backup level quarterback play on plays where Saquon Barkley's running out of the backfield up the seam, and he's just watching Saquon run this route the entire time. Never looks to anyone else on the field, just staring down at Saquon. Saquon runs into where three defenders are, and he's like, all right, now let me throw it. What are you doing to look off of that read that's not open? You can't just stare down a receiver and then throw it. Plus, you're staring him down, and the, and the defenders are just reading you, and they're reading the route, and then they're jumping on the route. There was at least three to four turnover-worthy plays from Daniel Jones in this game. We got lucky on a lot of them. He only fumbled the ball and turned it over once, but he should have had multiple interceptions in this game. We got lucky in that regard, but going down the line, we're not going to get that lucky. And I got to circle back because I remember what I was going to say earlier. I was really concerned when Joe Judge said that thing about, you know, treating the first few weeks of the season as the preseason again. I don't like that mentality. I think that is the worst mentality. I said that a few days ago to you, Alex. I said the Giants need to come out swinging. They need to try and, like, spark this offense immediately. Let's get off to a good start, hit the ground running, that kind of thing. Instead, we see the training wheels offense, the bland route concepts, vanilla offense by Jason Garrett. We've talked about that endlessly. We thought it might be different. We thought maybe they'll come out with a little bit of energy. But treating the first few weeks of the season as the preseason is how you put your team in a hole to start the year. And now the Giants are down 0-1, and they are in a hole, and they're going to have to climb their way out because other teams in the division, Dallas lost to, to you know the Buccaneers, but they looked phenomenal. That offense came out swinging. The Giants' offense came out real stale and stagnant and looked horrible. And that's what happens when you treat the first few weeks as the preseason. So, I, I can't understand that mentality when you're the head coach of a team going into the season. And again, I love Joe Judge, and I am one of his biggest supporters, but that mentality is what gets you killed in the long run. Taking it easy the first few weeks of the regular season, not choosing to set the tone, but instead choosing to let the tone set you, that's how you ultimately just play losers football like the Giants did today. Okay. there There is an equation where the Giants managed to come out of this looking like a team I can actually sit and watch for four quarters. Cause right now I can't, I can't do this again, man, straight up. I can't watch this for four quarters. I, it's my job. And I'm having a hard time. You know, it's been years of this crap and I just, I'm just having a hard time, man. There's only one way that they actually figure this out. And, you know, they did say like you, like you just mentioned Joe judge saying, you know, they wanted to use the first couple of, uh, you know, games as a de facto preseason, whatever, figuring things out. Washington lost Ryan Fitzpatrick today. Right, they lost Ryan Fitzpatrick. Then they go to Atlanta, who looked like absolute garbage. Okay, against the Eagles today, these are two very winnable games. Okay, this is an opportunity, right? This is an opportunity for the Giants to win against Washington and win against Atlanta, and then go into the latter portion of this schedule against New Orleans, who looked a great today against Green Bay. They looked phenomenal. Jameis Winston, it looks looks like a legitimate quarterback. I'd rather have him right now over Daniel Jones any any day of the week. Dallas, then Los Angeles. Okay, you have three insane games, Anthony. They need to figure it out now, right? The next two games are huge. This upcoming week on Thursday against against Washington, you know, they need to take advantage of Tyler H Henneke, right? They need to. They have to beat the crap out of him. They need to create turnovers. They need to get momentum. I know Logan Ryan limped off the field today. We'll see what happened with him. Darius Slayton got hit in the back at the end of the game there. Uh, hopefully he's okay. He dropped a couple pass to, passes today. Did not look good whatsoever. Hopefully they'll have Evan Ingram back and Kenny Galladay will be a little healthier. Kadarius Tony and Saquon Barkley. You know, when, when your running back has 27 rushing yards, like Daniel Jones did today, and he's leading the team in rushing yards, you're in trouble, right? The, there, you are not going to win in the NFL without a decent running game that can actually keep your, def sorry, keep your defense off the field. Right, you need to be able to run the football. You need to rack up minutes in that time of possession category. You need to keep your defense off the field. They have to do that against Washington next week. Saquon Barkley didn't look good. I mean, I get. I know a lot of people are going to say, he, you know, he's coming back from the injury. It makes sense that he didn't have a strong game. And I and obviously I'm going to give you that. You know, that's totally fair. But it's not like he didn't only look good. Devontae Booker didn't look good either. You know what I mean? He wasn't running the ball excellent. Yeah. Just One thing that I'll say with Saquon, he looked like he was running in the preseason. And if this is how you run in the preseason, 
maybe they should have just let him play in the preseason. Maybe he should have just ran like this in the preseason, gotten ready for the regular season, expedited this. Or maybe he just shouldn't be playing if he's not ready to go full speed and contribute to this team. Like, I don't even think he played that poorly. I think he played all right. Personally, I think the offensive line, the run blocking was horrendous. I thought that he was trying to be a patient runner. I thought that he was running very patiently and looking for holes that just never developed. So I actually don't want to criticize Saquon too much because, yes, he is coming back from the injury. And they really didn't give him much of an opportunity to get acclimated to the game again by holding him out of the preseason. But I thought he played fine. He made a couple guys miss. There were a couple plays. There was one play where he got hit in the backfield and still gained two yards. And I'm like, okay, that reminds me of Saquon. You know, like that looked like Saquon because most running backs get dropped for a two yard loss there. He got a two yard gain. Like he was just stumbling his way forward for two yards. He had that other play where he ran for the first down, carried like five people on his back. I thought that he played all right, but I just thought there was nothing around him like not a really good situation for him to gain yardage on the ground. The offensive line, I agree. Pass protection, they surprised me. They looked pretty decent. Run blocking, I thought they looked pretty bad. For, throughout the majority of this game, I thought they were pretty horrendous, and they didn't open up many holes for Devontae Booker or for Saquon Barkley. So I'm definitely disappointed in the offensive line's performance in that regard, and I actually don't want to criticize Saquon Barkley too much. But again, if he's running like this and he's running scared and he's running shy and he's not running with – the same mentality that you would expect him to because he's treating this as a preseason for him, you know, getting acclimated to the game. Maybe they just should have gotten him acclimated to the game in the preseason rather than waiting till the regular season to get him acclimated. So I understand maybe he wasn't fully healthy and ready to go three weeks ago in the preseason. And that could be the argument against this, but I don't know, man. I just don't like seeing teams treat the regular season as the preseason. The preseason exists for a reason. Let's kick off the training wheels and let's get going on offense rather than playing this conservative vanilla training wheel brand of offense. It's just ridiculous to me. And I I almost just like can't forgive this kind of low effort performance from the Giants offense today. Yeah. And, you know, uh, they just they just asked Joe Judge about uh, the moment he threw the challenge flag. And he said uh, it was an emotional moment when he threw the challenge flag. He said he was really trying to get the attention of the officials, took full responsibility for doing it. Well, yes. You did it, so no shit. You take full responsibility. So who else are you gonna blame? Who could you blame? <laughs> you see, what what he's essentially saying is the 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 referees weren't paying attention to him, so he threw his red flag at them to try and get their attention. What the hell does that mean? Honestly, that mean? I don't want to like be too harsh, but it's so immature. And I, he is one of the youngest head coaches in the NFL. But that is just like to have such an emotional reaction in such an important moment in the game to just throw the flag because you're pissed off. you got to keep your emotions in check. You're the head coach of the New York Giants. I get that you're one of the youngest coaches in the league. But come on, Joe Judge. Like, I don't know, Alex. You know me. People are going to be really shocked to hear how much I'm criticizing Joe Judge today because I'm literally like the biggest Joe Judge supporter, but I am pissed off at his performance today. He did not coach this football team well enough to win today. He did a lot of things wrong in this game. It set us up to lose this game. Joe Judge deserves equal blame, and I will criticize. I will be unbiased when I do this. I am not a biased sports analyst, right? I'm going to criticize whoever does the wrong thing, and Joe Judge was wrong in multiple ways today. He deserves all of this criticism, and I'm going to be harsh on him because I had pretty high expectations for him. He had high expectations for his team. All of it fell flat today. Just disheartening performance. Pretty much, man. I I, I have to say, it's going to be a long night ahead. I got the tequila out. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to forget already. Um, you know, looking forward to this game for so long and uh, waking up today and getting having being so excited. This is just devastating traumatizing you know and i am an emotional fan so don't really care um i try to give my my uh you know feedback and whatnot but at the same time like i can only handle so much without freaking the fuck out and (laughs) basically i have reached that point um it you just you can't hype this team up you can't say all the things that these coaches and players have said and then do that you know what i mean you can't you can't put that on the field after being so optimistic and being so um, excited about all of this team and the money and the players that, they, that they've gotten. You you can't do that. If I'm John Mara, I just called Dave Gettleman up and I said, buddy, you have three weeks. If we don't win the next two games and if we don't put up a good game against uh, the Saints in Dallas, 
your ass is gone, bro. You're gone. You know what I mean? Your quarterback is turning the ball over still. Your quarterback can't hold on to the ball. Your offensive line is a disaster. Your defense is a disaster. Your coaching staff is in is in disarray. Their their game plans are horrendous. They look like they're planning for like ice hockey. I don't understand. Like the corners are on on rollerblades. They're on ice skates. You know what I mean? They're they're nowhere to be seen. If I'm John Mara, I'm sending a warning shot to Dave Gettleman right now. You said we were going to fix this, and you just scored 13 points, really seven points. I don't even consider that garbage time touchdown, Pat static no. bullshit, no. part of the score. You scored seven points after I just gave you 80 plus million dollars, 80 million dollars, and premier draft capital to fix this freaking unit. Okay. 80 plus million dollars in draft capital fixes you, and you scored seven points in meaningful football. Seven points. This is on Gettleman because he's he's the one that has to answer for it now. It's on Gettleman and Jason Garrett, but it really it comes down to Gettleman. He's the one that has to take the blame now. There's nobody else to blame. You know, they fired Pat Shermer, they fired Ben McAdoo, they've let go of uh James Betcher, they've let go of off- offensive coordinators. Dave Gettleman's the last one standing. He's the last one standing that, that that deserves to take the blame for this freaking mess, right? And I'm hoping to God that they win the rest of their games and they prove me wrong. There's nothing in this world that would make me happier than being pissed off and angry right now and then proving me wrong. I hope to God that happens. You know what I mean? But right now, I can't stand it. Right now, right now, it, they are what they are, man. You are what you eat. And they just ate up the field with they, – they literally just sat there eating cheeseburgers instead of playing football, right? They they just showed us who they are with that game right there. They're not what we think they are. And I know some of them aren't healthy. I know some of them aren't healthy. But why are why is Kenny Galladay suddenly being targeted in garbage time? You know what I mean? It, logically, it doesn't make sense. Logically, it doesn't make sense. If you're going to use him in garbage time, use him in the middle of the game. You know what I mean? If you're going to use Saquon Barkley the entire garbage time drive, use him in the middle of the game. If you're going to start throwing the ball downfield, do it in the middle of the game. It's freaking ridiculous. And then they get to the red zone, and I don't think I've seen a more embarrassing red, z- red zone drive in my, oh my life. God. In my life. I We have Kenny Galladay, Kyle Ruff, Saqu- and, and they're Dude. throwing balls out of the end zone. It's Jason unbelievable. Garrett, Jason Garrett's play calling in the red zone has been a problem. It was a problem all of last year. It was so bad today. I Whenever we got to the red zone, I knew we weren't going to score, and I kind of just like checked out mentally. I'm like, it's a failure. I already know it. Every single play was just – there was nothing there. He didn't set up his players to be successful. I just – I can't today, man. I, I really – I'm hitting a breaking point, and I hate to be that big, you know, like hit the panic button after week one. I hate that. I don't like to be that way. I don't like to really just, you know, start freaking out after one game into the season, but – we did a lot this offseason. We were given a lot of promises and set a lot of expectations internally by the team this offseason. They spent a lot of money. None of that acclimated towards anything in week one. And Kenny Galladay looked awesome. He looked worth every dollar. And to me, he looked completely healthy. And he looked like he needed to be a bigger part of the game plan from the first quarter. But he just wasn't. He wasn't targeted. There were no plays set up for him. Nothing designed to go Kenny Galladay's way. What are the Giants doing? What is this coaching staff thinking? What was this game plan? This game plan literally did not put any of the key players in the position to succeed. We did not maximize anyone's talent. I just can't wrap my head around this game plan. I'm going to finish this episode saying this right now, okay? This is this really just pissed me off reading this. The Houston Texans scored 37 points today. When's the last time the Giants have scored 37 points, let alone Jason Garrett scoring 27 points in multiple games combined? Bro, even look at the Detroit Lions. They came out swinging. They put up however many points, over 30 points. Bro, they have by far the worst wide receiving core in the NFL. One of the worst that I've ever seen assembled by an NFL team and put out onto the field, and they still put up over 30 points. The Giants putting on the training wheels for the first few weeks of the season and choosing to treat this as an extension of the preseason – is bullshit. It's inexcusable, and they need to do something different. This is when the stupid. Detroit, it's when the plain Detroit Lions stupid are doing that shit to people. And Houston Texans, led by Tyrod Taylor, is scoring thirty-seven points. I think it's time to reevaluate who your freaking offensive coordinator is. Okay, I think it's time to reevaluate who your quarterback is. That, reevaluate yes. everything, man. 
like you they gotta really start need to reevaluate the extension of the preseason thing. I really wish that I made a big deal out of this on the podcast last week whenever Joe Judge said that. I chose not to because I've got faith in him and whatever. I really should have made a big deal out of it. Hearing a coach say the first few weeks of the regular season or extension of the preseason is absolutely the biggest red flag possible, and I knew that it was going to be damning for our offense in week one, and it's already proven to be they need to take the, the goddamn training wheels off and come out swinging in week two in order for me to feel any bit of confidence going down the road for the season. Because if we don't come out swinging, we don't score 20 plus 30 plus points in week two, I'm going to lose hope rather quickly. Two weeks in, I'm going to lose all hope for the year if our offense doesn't completely turn it around in week two. That, I mean, that's the timeline, man. Just with week two or, or, or die, man. You got to do something. Seven points in the in meaningful football is not enough. It's never going to be enough, man. We're never going to be a good team. We're never going to be a good team if we keep up at this rate, ever. You know, Daniel Jones can't finish a drive. How many times have we seen him lead this team down the field to throw an interception or fumble in the red zone or just can't even get get the pass on target in the red zone? You know what I mean? It took a Sterling Shepard, like, magical effort to get us in the freaking end zone today. It, it has to be easier than that. You know, it has to feel seamless. You know, watching Tyrod Taylor do it four times today, watching – um, I don't know, Jared Goff do it a bunch of times today, watching Sam Darnold pick apart the Jets, watching Teddy Bridgewater do it to our defense that we thought was a top five unit really pisses me off, man. And we're still sitting here like, Daniel Jones could be the guy. Daniel Jones can do it. I'm like, no, he he can't. I'm done. I'm done defending him at this point. He just can't do it. We've seen enough. We've seen enough. I don't think he's the quarterback at this point in time. And and. I really am. I'm really, you know, I, I like you said, I hate to be negative. I hate to make, you know, these types of claims now, but it's too late for me. It's too late. It's yeah. the third season, man. It's the third year. And we just saw Je- the same Daniel Jones that we saw last year again, do the same thing. Fumble when it meant, when it meant, when it mattered most on an important drive, he fumbled it away and he threw almost through multiple interceptions. You know what I mean? That's the Daniel Jones we know, and I don't think that's ever going to go away, unfortunately. The offensive line played well enough for him to win this game. They played well enough to win this game. Yeah, The offensive line. It, so it really just comes down to the play calling and the quarterback. Yeah, again, I hate to be super negative and hit the panic button after one week of the 2021 season, but doesn't this one week not even feel like a new season? Doesn't it just feel like an extension of last year? This felt exactly like a loss from 2020. I feel like I was watching week – 18 of 2020. It just did not feel like a new team in a new year with a new brand and a new mentality. It didn't feel like that at all. So yeah, I think we're all kind of panicking and we're all really disappointed right now. And I think everyone's feelings are justified because there was not a lot of positivity to take away from this game for the Giants, a team that scored seven true points and and threw in six points, six points in garbage time at the end of the game, which was just you know, kind of sad to watch anyway. I usually get excited when your team scores a touchdown. I was sad watching them score that touchdown. That was just stupid. But, yeah, man, I think I've said my piece. I've said plenty. I've been really critical of the Giants, even some of my favorite players and coaches. I've been very critical, and I think most of us are feeling this way. It's going to be a tough one, but we've got a short week, I guess. Now we just kind of have to turn our attention towards Thursday. We've got a short week. We'll be facing off with the Washington football team. And hopefully the Giants offense and team in general can turn things around on Thursday. On the bright side, there was no significant injuries. So, you know, at least we got out with that, got away with that. You know, hopefully uh, Logan Ryan's okay. Those uh, guys like Darius Slayton are banged up, you know, are okay. And they can play on Thursday. They'll be all right. Um, But that's it. That's it. That's really it, guys. Um, I I hope you have a great night. I hope that, you know, you try to forget about this. Have a little tequila time. Have some dinner. Um, sleep easy because hopefully we'll have a better, a better experience on Thursday. You know, we'll be gearing up for that. Of course, we'll be getting you guys on the information, injury reports and, uh, and news you could possibly have, but we need some positivity around here and a win would provide it at least a little bit for us, uh, at least give us something to believe in. Cause right now I have no, I have no faith. I've lost, I'm just tired, man. Like after a couple seasons of losing like this, it doesn't take much for me to lose faith in the team. You know, usually I can stick around and, and, but this feels like an extension of last year. You know what I mean? It, 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 honestly, it looked worse. It looked worse than last year. Our defense looked better last year, and our offense looked the same. And we still, I mean, invested so much. So, guys, make sure to subscribe below um, on uh, YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. And we'll catch you guys on the next New York Giants episode.